Good morning, everyone. Just letting uh, people uh, come and turn to their audio and get their cameras sorted. Just give you, let's give that a couple of seconds. Okay. Well, yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session: project-based learning, developing students' curiosity and creativity, hosted by the Centre for Learning and Teaching at Newcastle University. So, uh, as you probably well know by now, our session today is part of our Imagine If Digital Conference series. With this year's, uh, we're exploring the theme, Imagine If Creativity Gave Us the Freedom to Learn Without Inhibition and to Accept Mistakes as Part of Our Lifelong Discovery. My name's Andrew Garrard and I am Area Manager for North of Tyne and Arts Mark Lead for Culture Bridge Northeast. We are part of Arts Council England's national network of bridge organisations, connecting the education and arts and cultural sectors to enable better access to quality arts and cultural education for all children and young people, no matter their circumstances. And I'm sure you'll agree, this is more pertinent than ever in our current climate. Um, a couple of little housekeeping things before we get going. Um, we are uh, reminded of, of our delegate guidelines, which we sent to you in your joining packs. Specifically, we'd like to ask you to remain muted. I know we're all pretty good at this now, um, unless speaking, and we suggest you keep your settings um, on side-by-side -side speaker view so you can see whoever is presenting um, full screen rather than everyone else in the room. And it, we have a, a little request, if possible. Um, we would like you to rename yourself, um, keep your name, obviously, but um, we are trying to figure out who are schools, who's from cultural sector. Um, so if you're from a school, um, it'd be great if you could put a capital S after your name. So if you just right click on your video, it'll give you the option to uh, change your name. And if you are from the cultural sector um, or arts and cultural sector, please add a capital C after your name. And I know there'll be people here who are both. What do they do? You can choose, you, so you can put an S or a C. So if you could um, go ahead and do that, that'd be great. Thank you very much. That'll really help us now break out later. Um, if you have a question, uh, please put them in the chat box as we go along and we'll, uh, we'll have a better chance to, to deal with those towards the end of the session. And also we have uh, closed captions available today for, um, for the session. So if you click on the live transcript at the bottom of your screen, it has two C's, and then click on that and it will be an option for show subtitles. So you can do that. Uh, we gathered consent in your booking forms, but just a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be used later on as a digital resource and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel um, from next week. And please feel free to share your work shop experience today and what you've done uh, throughout the session. Uh, on our, if you can tag us in, our Twitter handle is at culturebridgeny. And if you can use the hashtag this year, which is hashtag imagineif21. Um, we are also joined today by Danny, who is our digital stage manager. So if you have any uh, technical issues, just private message her and she should be able to help you. And with that, I think it's time to hand over to Alison, Ulrika and David. Have a great session. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, and I'm really delighted that we've got Danny as well to uh, allay my technology kind of fears. So thank you very much to her too. Um, so we're talking to you today about project-based learning, developing students' curiosity and creativity. Um, all right, I'll try and get my slide to move, which it doesn't really want to do at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, starting not very well there. So Ulrika, if you go down mm. to the bottom left of your slide, you should be able to see um, faintly a couple of arrows. Oh, right. OK. Um, click on that. that OK, sorry. Help. Thank you. <laughs> Already not starting very well. Right. So first of all, who are we? Well, we are Professor David Lee, Professor of Curriculum Innovation, who's been working for, despite his very useful appearance that you'll see in a minute, uh, many, many years on think developing thinking skills. Uh, inquiry and project-based learning with schools. Uh, Alison and I are research associates who've been working with him for the last few years. And what we're drawing on particularly is a two-year project that was funded by the EDGE Foundation called Project-Based Learning Goes to University, where we worked on over 25 projects with schools, colleges, all sorts of, uh, with the universities, local businesses, and lots of cultural sector organizations. And that's what we're kind of drawing on in this uh, presentation today. Um, so what are we going to do as part of our workshop? Well, first of all, we're going to talk to you a little bit about what project-based learning is, and that includes some of the key principles, and we're going to do this fairly quickly because we do want it to be quite interactive, also introducing you to some of our past 
past projects. We're then going to try and get you to have a go at working through using some of our resources, uh, a little project of your own, just to kind of build in those principles and see how that works. And we're hoping that because there'll be a mix of teachers and cultural sector organisations that you'll kind of get a sense of what working together can actually achieve. We've got some case studies. We're going to think about the benefits of this approach, what some of the challenges and risks are, because obviously, uh, you know, there are lots of things that can come up and that people might make people feel quite anxious. So we'll try and think about how we might plan for these as a, as a group. Uh, and then we've obviously got our final questions and thinking about our next steps. So what is project-based learning? Well, we're starting with a definition from the Buck Institute for Education, who are like a global sort of leading organisation who provide training for uh, project-based learning uh, to teachers uh, all around the world, actually. Um, so their definition is students work on a project over an extended period of time for a week to a semester, so a term. It engages them in solving a real world problem or answering a complex question and they demonstrate their knowledge and skills by developing a public product or a presentation for a real audience. Now, I mean, we've been doing this for quite a long time and from uh, our perspective, we, we try and talk about it in terms of actually something called community curriculum making because we wanted schools to sort of develop their curricula in a way that embeds sort of work with the community. So it would be pupils and students undertaking a curriculum project or an inquiry using the assets within the community. So that could be local resources. It could be focusing on the issues that uh, are kind of like pertinent to the area that the school is situated in, going to visit the local places, working with the local people and organisations. We would want a community curriculum project to be planned and conducted with those community members. That would sort of be like the ideal scenario. So actually planning a project together and at the, or at the very least having people coming in and working with uh, the children and young people. And as much as possible, it would accommodate the students' own curiosity and creativity and their responsibility. So very much giving them as much agency as you kind of feel comfortable giving. And that, that is something, perhaps one of the risky sides of this kind of work. So something that might come up a bit later on. When we conduct a community curriculum making project, um, and we are going to go into some of these key features in a lot more detail in a minute, these are the kind of things that we would expect. We would expect a project to be launched in some way. Um, they would kind of like hook the children in, the young people in, and have a sort of a wow factor. As I've said, we're going to go into that in a bit more detail. It will result in some kind of product. So the curriculum work that you were doing will result in something at the end. A report, a film, an exhibition. We've got a crop in there because one of the projects David worked in was about growing potatoes. It will embed subject content knowledge and skills. So the skills side, you know, teamwork, um, being able to do presentations, working to deadlines, that's all really important. But we also believe that it is the subject content knowledge is also important, whether that's national curriculum, ideally, perhaps, so that it will become embedded uh, within school work. But also just that kind of, you know, if you're doing a, a project about climate change, that you would want that really good science uh, information, geography information, uh, so the subject content is really important. Without that, a project is more likely to be sort of just left, I think, to a nice little activity at the end of the school year. It would have a, the community as audience or client, so they might set the challenge, but they definitely need to be the audience in order to raise the quality of the work. And uh, the stat line that David developed a few years ago was going places, meeting people and doing and making things. That, that kind of like underpins uh, what a project is. And it's through this that we develop social and cultural capital and that the young people and the children uh, develop more complex identities, a better understanding of themselves. So we've got two quick polls then, because I know we're going to go into this in a little more detail, but we would kind of just like to have a sense of whether any of you have been involved in any problems, uh, projects like this before. You should see the poll up on your screen now. Um, and this first one is about being involved in a curriculum innovation or a project, possibly more appropriate to those of you who are teachers, 
but it may be that you're in a cultural organisation and you have been involved with something. It's looking pretty positive so far that you've all, or that about half, over half of you have been involved in something, which is very, very good. So this won't be entirely new to you, what we're going to talk about. We've got one person left. That's the poll close now, Alison. So there was everything on screen. So very positively, well over half of you have been involved in a curriculum innovation of some sort. Um, but there's plenty of people who haven't. So hopefully what you can take away from this today is some ideas of how you could get involved with this, either as a teacher in a school or as part of a cultural organisation. And what we're also hoping for is that there'll be an opportunity for you to network and connect with people who might help you to do that. And we'll talk about that later on. If Danny can share poll two. This one asks, if you've worked with an external partner or a school, so that's a little different. So particularly if you were a teacher, you may have led some sort of curriculum innovation by yourself within your school, but you might not have had the opportunity to work with an external partner, such as a cultural or a heritage organisation. So again, we'll see how many people have had that opportunity. And again, it's looking extremely positive so far. We may be preaching to the converses here. You might be telling us more than we can tell you. Brilliant. And again, very, very positive that you've all, well, a, a vast majority of you have been involved and worked with somebody else. You will be able to give us your advice, your tips, um, and certainly those who haven't been able to work when we put you into breakout rooms, if the ones who have been able to work with an external partner can share their advice and their experiences of what it was like, you're going to find this a really, really good melting pot of, uh, of, of tips and, and helpful support, I think, through this session. So very interesting. Thank you very much, Danny, for sharing those. Great, so just a quick note for the presenters, if the polls are still on your screen, you can just click the X in the corner, no one else can see them. I think David's going to take you through now some of the key principles underpinning PBL. It may be that you have used PBL or that you've experienced it before. If you haven't, there are some key principles um, that David will take you through now. David, you're on mute. Somebody had to say it. Here I am. Thank you, Alison. So one of the really important things in sustaining an inquiry over time or a project is to have this notion of a central or a driving question. And there's a quote there that I'm not going to go through from the guidance from PBL Works, an American organization. And I think one of the issues is who provides the question and I think uh, with younger children in some circumstances you may want to kind of control and focus that question but with more experience many of your uh, students may be able to be the uh, owners and uh, originators of that driving question so that's something for you to consider and work on over time you know, who provides that but it's important to have it at the at the center and you can see in the little box there that some of the reasons why you would you'd want to have that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the next slide. So if you are new to uh, project-based learning stroke inquiry, this structure can be incredibly helpful in terms of um, giving you a more gentle lead in, provide you with a, a structure. So there's the notion of a hierarchy of questions that take you from the introduction or the hook through a process of the students, pupils themselves, uh, gathering knowledge. It's neatly here called the collective knowledge process. 
going on to forming an opinion. And for those of you who are familiar with philosophy for children and all its protocols, will know about the value of children giving their views and opinions. On to a deeper question. And finally, going towards the applied or problem solving question, which would relate to the product that you are producing. And you can see down in the middle column under the example, there is an example taken from uh, a lower secondary school doing a project related quite considerably to science, but also bringing in other partners of what does it take to run a half marathon? That's the driving question. And of course, neatly, that word run divides into the process of physically running, but also organizing. And the organizing here is very much the driving question. What does it take to run a half marathon? And then you can see the other four question stages underneath the heading. I'm not going to go through them, but you can see that down at the bottom, there's, can we organize at least a simple race applying some of what we know, which doesn't have to be a half marathon. It can be one kilometer or two kilometers around the school playing fields. And if your playing fields are not big enough, then going around several times. And uh, getting parents and others to enter, possibly. And that's a, an activity that's been proved to be very successful. Okay, next slide. And what's important here, particularly in the, the diagram part, is that subject knowledge is critical from right from the beginning. And you'll see later on when we invite you to do a bit of planning for a project that begins to come into your imagination, the subject knowledge is really important. You know you have to deliver it for national curriculum purposes. And therefore, right from the beginning, it's important to be able to consider what subject knowledge, both the substantive knowledge, the kind of factual stuff, and the procedural knowledge, which parts do we want to include here, and how we're going to make sure that it is included. And from other work, um, there are various models of thinking about this. It can be front loaded. We go kind of think of the last slide with the students doing lots of research. So they are accessing much of that knowledge or it can come from your uh, normal processes of explaining to the, to the students, giving them a kind of the equivalent of a, a lecture. It can be spread throughout the topic. Some of it can be unloaded. And we're not gonna uh, dwell on this particular slide uh, very much, but this is from some of our colleagues who work with Julie McGrain and Anne uh, Decheveria, who've developed the notion of a, a knowledge pool that feeds the whole project and at various points that knowledge is being accessed for uh, at critical moments in the project. So uh, lots of interesting ways in which you can think about how national curriculum subject knowledge is woven into the project, but I think the key thing is you need to plan it carefully. Thank you. So that's the key principles. There are some key elements of project-based learning as well, which if you have already been involved with this, you'll recognize these. The first is a launch event. Now the launch event is really important to hook your students into this. The whole point of PBL is it's supposed to be inspiring and exciting. It's supposed to make them motivated and want to learn more. So what better way but to hook them in with something that's maybe a little bit different, a little bit unusual, and certainly a little bit unexpected. You can see here, you can set up your classroom a little bit differently. We've had teachers who have set their classroom up as a crime scene so that the students walked in and the room was covered with evidence, fake blood, footprints, broken glass, and they had to figure out what was going on. You could take them on a visit, um, slightly more difficult in these times, but it could be to a university, a local employer, somewhere that's a bit different where they get an instant feel for what this project is going to be about. Um, and it's, it's completely different to their school environment. Or you can invite a visitor in. Previous projects have involved Northumbria Police, where police officers came in to talk about cyber, uh, cyber crime. 
we've uh, done projects involving the automotive industry where there were lots of options there. There were people from Nissan, uh, there were local mechanics, um, and there was a Cooper BMW car there, which obviously enthused students instantly. So you're looking here for inspiration and motivation, but you're also providing the subject context. You're providing subject content from the outset, and you're introducing that big question, the challenge, the driving question, as David just said. And if I can just chip in there, Alison, just going back to the running a half marathon, the hook there was to get two members of staff to come into the classroom unannounced in their running kit. And uh, that was a really good hook. I'm pleased that I wasn't involved in that one. So next one, please, Ulrika. So all through this project, you're going to be aiming towards a final product. And that final product is something that the students will develop. It could be that you give students a lot of leeway in deciding what they develop and what they create at the end of it. It could be that you've got a specific product in mind that links with the whole project. But you're thinking about what will the students do or create? And part of our little strap line is doing um, and, and making things. And that's something that is a little bit different again from just writing an essay at the end of it, producing a paper. We've had newspaper articles, uh, we've had recipes and menu cards, dietary plans, brochures, animations, marketing campaigns. Keep it relevant. We had one college who was thinking about using um, a, a advertising campaign and they'd suggested paper, they'd suggested radio, and then we came up with social media because let's face it, that's what kids use nowadays. So try and target it at something that the kids will actually want to produce uh, and something that they'll want to work together to make. We have, if Ulrika can show you, a little tiny video that some of you may have even been involved in, um, which was about the suffragettes. So Ulrika will try and share that, or Danny is sharing that now for you. So it's, I mean, it's a lovely little um, animation there. Um, and that was actually a project that was in collaboration with Special Collections um, at Newcastle University Library, who we've worked with quite frequently. But you can see how proud the students will have been to create that. And they learned the subject content through it. This was the whole point of it. It was about suffragettes, but how much more exciting to create a stop motion animation. Um, then just rely entirely from a textbook and produce a paper at the end of it. Um, the final aspect that's very, very important is the showcase. Here we go. Um, and thinking of that animation, the whole point of that is to share it with other people. So by inviting in 
guests and audience, maybe it's their parents, their families, um, friends, important people such as the people that they've worked with, the people who have visited, local employers, you know, other staff members, and by showing it to them, research has shown that that really increases motivation throughout the project. So the students will really take more pride in their work and more care with what they produce because they know that it's going to be for an authentic um, audience. And that whole theme of authenticity comes through all of this. You're working on an authentic task um, with an authentic product and an authentic audience in mind. Um, it's, it really raises the quality of the work that they produce and it's a lovely opportunity for them to share their learning. If you can use somewhere outside the school for a showcase, we've had local libraries being used, art galleries, it really makes it much more powerful as well because they know that that work that they're producing is on display to a lot of people. Um, and it really is, it's something extremely memorable for them um, throughout their school career. Um, right, so the importance of visits out and visitors in. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot said about developing cultural and social capital. It's all about knowing who as well as knowing how. Um, it broadens the horizons of the young people involved. And I really like the research undertaken by Stephen, Stephen Ball about imagined futures. And he did it about in the, the late 90s, but I actually think it's still pertinent today. So he interviewed 16 and 17 year olds about what they wanted to do with their lives and their careers. And he found that there was a minority that kind of had a really clear picture of what they wanted to be and how to achieve it, you know, what to study, what kind of work experience to do. There was another group that sort of had an idea of what they'd like to be, like I'd like to be an architect, but had absolutely no idea how to achieve that. And then there was another really big group who had sort of no idea about the future and what possible career they could have. And it's because through projects like this that you and meeting lots of different people, getting them to talk about their own career journeys, seeing what you can study at university, that this kind of enables uh, children and young people to sort of imagine these different types of future. It also provides the expertise, as we've seen from uh, what we've described earlier. You know, you get that knowledge from going to a, a museum, to a university, to a different kind of business or context. You, you meet the people, you get the expertise and that context, and that's, that's really important in a project. I'm just going to touch a little tiny bit on feedback and assessment. We have created a guide that goes into this in much more detail, uh, and we'll be giving you some links towards that at the end. Um, obviously, there's like a, a kind of a formative and a summative element and a sort of formal and informal element to any kind of assessment. Critique is a really important part, that kind of ongoing feedback, which is obviously raising the quality of the work. And that's particularly important if uh, the work's going to be on show to the public. Um, we were involved or worked with a school in Washington where they were actually creating a mural for the headquarters of the uh, Rolls-Royce offices that were nearby. When they presented the work, the uh, Rolls-Royce actually kind of said, no, this, this just isn't good enough. We can't have this in, in our foyer. And actually the head teacher was actually quite shocked. I think he hadn't kind of experienced this sort of, you know, normally everybody just saying all the children's work is lovely. So it's about raising that quality and that being ongoing and built into a project. You may be wanting to uh, assess against national curriculum statements and as we were saying you know we do think the subject content can be taught through projects so we, we would really want that to be embedded you know there are opportunities for self-reflection and again when we show you the guide we've got the examples from from different teachers that have done you know outcome stars all sorts of things about how how children and young people feel they're doing in terms of their teamwork and ability to present things like that Peer assessment, um, you know, so children sort of uh, giving feedback on each other's work. And how could that possibly be documented? Well, showing that process and the development maybe through sort of portfolios. I mean, if we're thinking about, you know, um, showing failure and how, how things develop uh, as is part of this conference sort of theme, that portfolio would be a really good way of demonstrating that, that kind of working over, over an improvement over time. Going to David now. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh yes, and I've managed to unmute this time. Well done, me. So, um, inevitably, for many schools, Ofsted considerations are up there. 
and uh, you will have your own views about uh, how you manage the whole process if Ofsted is in the offing for you. Those are some of the um, prescriptions in relation to the curriculum. You, they may be incredibly familiar to you, but I'll let you pause and read, read down yourself. And I will just pick up the one at the bottom, which is about connecting new knowledge into larger concepts. And I think the importance and relevance of connecting to issues that are out in the community is that it provides that really good opportunity to bring those larger concepts and subjects into focus because of the relevance they have to meaning and authenticity. And uh, it's, it's also you know, pertinent to really consider this issue about cultural capital. But for many young people, okay, they need some uh, support with English and maths. But for many people, it's the, the, it's the lack of experience of the wider world that they're missing that provides both knowledge, but inspiration and the ability to navigate and work out what's of value in life. Okay, next slide. And there's a little bit more about Ofsted. Again, I'll let you browse through those two little excerpts. But our trump card almost is provided in the blue box. Being able to speak about the way in which curriculum projects are providing that access to cultural capital and enrichment. So that's a real trump card. And if we just dwell, sorry, if we just go back for a moment, Yes, so those issues about resilience, confidence and independence, and the importance of physical and mental health. Now your school kind of may be a little bit hesitant about focusing very much on those aspects of the Austria framework. And, and to be fair, subject knowledge has come up more prominently, but they are really important. So many of you will believe that. So yeah, next slide. And then there are the parts of the Gatsby benchmarks, increasingly important in, from key stage two onwards, and of course in key stage, key, key stage three and four. And there is a, an extract from those Gatsby benchmarks. So you can be confident that in pursuing projects, you are really demonstrating that you have a broad and balanced curriculum that really meets the needs of young people in the 21st century. If we only stick to subject knowledge, we are really selling young people short. Thank you. Right, I'm just, before we have a go at doing something together uh, in groups, I'm just gonna quickly take you through a project that was a collaboration between the Great North Museum, um, ourselves, um, the history, the School of History, uh, Classics and Archaeology at the University and West Jensen Primary School. And it was on the subject of ancient Greece, which is the key stage two curriculum. And basically the statement just says something like the student, the pupils need to know about ancient Greece. It's extremely open-ended and sometimes quite difficult then for teachers to address. Right, I'll just go to the next page. So it started as a very collaborative planning uh, process. Uh, you can see that this is one of the kind of um, timetables that was discussed. So we would we would come together every few weeks and it took several months to actually plan to sort of understand each other's perspectives, to work out even just from a timetabling perspective. This was taking place every afternoon for nearly six weeks, so quite, quite a big project. Just understanding, you know, when there were uh, sports days and all sorts of things, just really getting to know each other, what kind of subject content would be relevant for the children as well. 
It started with a launch at the Great North Museum because there's an ancient Greece uh, chef and gallery there full of all the artifacts. And that's kind of something, I mean, I, I would imagine there are people perhaps who work at Great North Museum here at this event today. But they have a, a really fantastic inquiry process. I see, I notice, I wonder which, uh, if you haven't been as a teacher before, that's a really great way that they introduce children to the museum uh, archives and collections. They then carried on back in school with workshops uh, and that involved work that the teachers were just kind of doing as part of their normal work with a little bit of input from both the lecturer in archaeology and also some PhD students and they brought in lots of artifacts with them. So that was the ongoing work in school. And then the work that the students had produced ended up back in that original gallery that they had uh, where they'd gone and done the launch event. So they would then be able to take their parents round. So these are the actual galleries in the museum with the real artifacts and the children's work sort of running alongside it. And that was just such a fabulous way to end the project, really giving value to the work that the children had done. So, I mean, we think there's this, it's this kind of collaborative planning process that we think is really important and, and is what kind of can raise the quality of a project more generally. Um, teachers and the partners learn from each other's expertise. You know, the teachers, the teachers involved in that ancient Greece project, they next time they teach that subject, they're going to have resources and that knowledge themselves. The partners learn about um, engaging with sort of young people because the teachers obviously ha have the expertise on how, how to kind of make sure that the, the language is right, uh, the way that uh, children can really access that information. So there's definitely this mutually beneficial uh, kind of process involved. Uh, we talk quite a lot about brokerage in terms of this collaborative process. Um, I mean, some schools like West Jesmond actually had at the time a teaching assistant who actually was the community kind of broker and that was her role, but not many schools are as lucky as that. But most places like universities, cultural sector organisations will have outreach departments that can, can be contacted. And of course, you'll be as a teacher, you might develop your own kind of networks over time. The more you do, the more people you get to know and the more you become a broker yourself. Plus, there'll also be parents and grandparents and other teachers within a, in, within a school that also have lots of good contacts. It's about trying to think about who could help you. And I know that all of the cultural sector organisations that we work with are like really keen to work with schools and, and, and that's, uh, you know, they will broker those connections too. So, so, so when all we can mute, because yeah. Yeah. we're in the same room. So that first half was the easy half. That was us just talking at you. I'm sure that you've all managed to wake up a little bit on this Thursday morning and you are now raring to go for the second half, which is going to involve you doing some collaboration. So we've got about 15 minutes for you to go into breakout rooms, which Danny is going to organise. And you're going to try to collaboratively plan a project. This is where it could all go very wrong because we are going to attempt to share a Google Drive document with you that one of you will need to open in that group and take responsibility for editing. If it goes wrong, just have a chat about it um, and we'll be fine. But we're going to pop into the rooms as well. You're then going to come back into the main room to share your ideas with about two minutes a group. So we're looking at about 20, 25 minutes of you doing the work here. And then we'll finish off with that last 15 minutes um, where we will sort of discuss, have some final thoughts and think about where to go from here. What the sort of networking and connections opportunities are for all of you to go from here. So Danny has just clicked on this, the um, Ulrich has moved to the screen. You may be able to click on the link, otherwise Danny is going to put, I think, the links, uh, the links in. Okay, she has started. In fact, I'm going to hand over to Danny to tell you this bit because it's probably easier. Fab, thank you, Alison. So as Alison mentioned, when you're in your breakout rooms, we're going to share a Google Doc link for you to hopefully be able to work on live. But just in case anyone's browser won't let them access that, if you could click on the link that I've put in the chat right now, that will just take you to an image of the document that we'll be working on. Um, so if everyone could click the link I put in the chat now and have that open, because you won't be able to access it once I put you in your breakout groups, that would be fab. So I'll just give everyone 10 seconds to do that. And then I'm gonna open the breakouts now. So once I do that, you'll get a pop-up on your screen. And if you just select okay or accept, that will move you into your breakouts. Um, and I'll give you some time warnings when you're in there as well, just to let you know when your 15 minutes are coming up. 
Um, so I'm going to open the breakouts now. So we'll see you all shortly. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had a, a good uh, good discussion there. Now, we'd like to get a little bit of uh, of your voice in this this session. So um, I'm not going to start with group one because I completely failed uh, in my mission to give them the link. So sorry about that. It wasn't my fault. It was my computer, honestly. Um, so I'm going to go straight to group two and then we'll go three and then we'll go back to one. Um, so if somebody from group two, uh, that's very handily shared, um, would like to talk us through um, why you came up with this. Um, yeah, let, let's go with that. So if anyone would like to volunteer, that would be lovely. Thank you. I don't mind talking it through. Thanks, Heather. Um, okay, so we thought uh, it connected to lots of different curriculum areas. So um, history and how the town or place has changed over time um, and looking at sort of uh, going back into timelines and, and sort of looking at sources of information that from uh, from the records and the archives and things like that. Um, maths, linking sort of population and sort of um, but like graphs to show different dem like different de demographics and maybe those changes and mapping them. Um, and then geography, so like the mapping the sort of physical and human characteristics of a local environment and sort of that could link to sort of walking around the place and, and sort of like directly mapping things um, in their right, really really local area. Um, Linking to English, so talking to maybe like interviewing grandparents, parents about their uh, reflections on place and then link, linking to sort of industry. So linking to careers and like maybe looking at the sort of changing nature of um, employment or sort of businesses in the area. Um, so then we looked at who could help us do this project. So we thought about museums and artists and like linking to employer visits um, and obviously parents and grandparents and bringing in potentially like local storytellers to explore uh, local stories. Um, and we put that um, education partnership could help connect to cultural organizations and museum partnerships to sort of get the right experts and people in place. Um, and then looking at sort of, yeah, visiting your local area, um, maybe visiting an employer. So we thought, you know, if we live near a wind farm, like sort of that future, thinking about what, what a future place looks like as well. Um, and looking at museum archives and things like that. Um, and then we thought we that would make a really good exhibition of like sort of past, present and future, um, potentially a film of sort of those interviews with local residents and employers um, and, and something about them making something themselves that maybe self-directed um, or that sort of huge maps on the floor made of various materials. Um, and then we thought we would invite uh, obviously school and parents, wider community, potentially town planners and sort of governments as sort of government organisations sort of like taking the opinions of young people and their thoughts of especially about the future of their place um, and sort of having an exhibition launch potentially at a local library or village hall and then we thought this could be assessed through scrapbooks and portfolios and photographs and linked to numeracy and literacy attainment and we thought the main uh, challenges would be sort of timetabling and costs and finding the right experts and contacts and sort of having that whole school buy-in for the project and we thought this would be addressed through making sure there's plenty of time to plan it and potentially building in sort of teach training and cpd that's what we got to brilliantly talked through as well thank you <laughs> um, okay so for group three is anyone who'd, who'd be willing to uh, talk us through their sheet No volunteers. I'll I'll point. In fact, I don't actually know who was in group three. So, uh, you know. So in group three, we had Annalisa, Bethany, Lucy, and Val. I can see a message from Bethany in the chat. <clears throat> it says probably would take too long to type. So in general, focus of the famous elements of local area, visiting iconic areas and buildings, having visits from local icons and business owners. Um, is there anyone from that group that would like to pop your mic on and um, just expand on that a little bit? Hi, yeah, this is Lucy here. Um, 
we we had a very helpful contribution from Bethany, but it was through the chat and uh, she was the teacher in our group as opposed to the three other three being from cultural organizations so we were very interested to hear what she had to say i mean i think um just very briefly you can see from the the plan that uh, there are a lot of similar ideas with with the previous uh, presentation um and i think um we we all felt that it was a great opportunity for partnership working working with organizations and individuals um, in your in your local town, wherever that may be, and I think you know the sort of curriculum links um, to maths and science and literacy, um, not necessarily being the most obvious areas, but certainly you know from an arts perspective, um, it was really good to see those being included as part of of that whole kind of project approach. Um, and yeah, someone's just said they really like like the idea of a song, which we thought was a great suggestion that came in, um, and maybe a guided tour, getting the children to do a guided tour of the town with small groups of parents, a kind of promenade idea, um, and maybe having a zine or some kind of guide produced as, as an output of the project. So yeah, just a lot of, a lot of ideas there um, on, the, on the plan, and it would be a great one to do. Great, thanks Lucy, and thank you Bethany for your contributions and your help and support for that. Um, okay, so we shall go to, um, you won't have the benefit probably of this, the share screen here, or you might do, we'll see, um, for group one, if anyone likes to talk um, about what they were discussing. Uh, well, I think uh, mainly <laughs> if we say we didn't do it, no, I didn't mean that we didn't do it, um, we didn't fill it in the way you asked us to do, I'm really sorry about that, but that's, um, no, didn't mean that we didn't. That didn't mean that we didn't have a rich conversation about different things that was in there, um, and quite a few people were saying things like um, it's quite hard to get people to use uh, people in the community that's different for them that they go on the safe bet. So they've used them before, so they'll use them again. Um, so that was that was one of the things that we talked about. We also talked about um, how we can get involved in projects that probably don't appear to be on a creative um, line, but is creative in, the, in a way. So you might want to connect in with um, the food bank or your local supermarkets and things, and it'll still become part of a, um, a holistic project rather than being just a certain, a certain um, subject as, as the project. Um, but I think um, we, all, we all agree that using the community is, and offering and, and I think making sure that the community know what's inside your place as well is something that you know it's not just about the community coming in it's about us going out as well so they can see us um, and what's going on in our world but I think mainly we all agreed well I hope we all agreed that um, people who want to do a pop project based learning kind of style they need to be brave and courageous and they need to take that one step away from what you talked about before Alison about that pencil and paper and you can still get the you can still get the learning you can still get the results you can still get the children motivated in a way that they're active learners that they will still develop the knowledge that they need to have to actually achieve what they need to achieve sorry we didn't do around the village though no that's great thanks Sue that's brilliant is there anything else Amy No, you did a sterling job, so well done. Okay, great. <laughs> Does any of the team want to respond to any of that? I have any comments to what's been mentioned? It could, if I could just come in, um, I think we've got a, a fantastic broad view of some of the possibilities. Uh, sometimes what you need is that driving question that really gives you a focus because you, you cannot cope with a huge amount of looking at change in the area. So a, a question like, um, how and why are our shops changing is a way of really focusing down and getting uh, many of the benefits that we're talking about. And all you need is, is some kind of um, starting point in the past, like a, a photograph of the lower shops or somebody who's got, there are old maps of what shops there used to be. And then using the memory of older people in the community about what shops there used to be before the shops that are there now. Uh, which opens up lots of really rich avenues uh, because, you know, talking about my own local town, Pruda, there is a little history society and they've got a fantastic range of resources and old photographs that can be drawn upon. 
And it, it's very uh, evident that in Prida that the shops that have really popped up in the last few years are lots more fast food shops, hairdressers. We've got two tattoo parlors and I've lost count of the number of hairdressers, which all makes for, for a very interesting exploration about why things are, are changing over time. Thanks, I'll mute myself now. So that, that is the planning map that we tend to use. So thank you if you attempted to fill it in. And if you just had a rich discussion, I think you've got a lot of, out of this. So it was really interesting to listen to. And I would really love to hear all of these songs that have been produced. So if anybody can email me those, that'd be amazing. Thanks. Um, so that's the planning map. Well, Rika, if you want to move on. We do have a couple more examples of a couple of projects that we have done. One was on interactive archives with Corbridge Middle School. That was working with a PhD student here. One was... This the next one was a great one, A Tale of Two Sieges. Some of you might have been involved with that, actually. That was with Ponteland High and Newark Academy, so it involved a bit of travelling across the country as well. Um, and we had loads of different external partners involved with that. That was a really, really rich, exciting project, actually. Um, these are all available on our website and also in the guide as well. And we'll give you all that information and we'll also give you this PowerPoint at the end. However, we'd like you to um, collaborate again, and again, this is a little bit of technology, um, on a Scrumbler board, which is a bit like a Padlet, if you've ever used one, but it's free. Um, and that Scrumbler board, you can add virtual post-it notes. So Danny is going to share that link, and if you click on it, you should be able to add a post-it note. And again, I'll be able to share uh, what you have all added. So if you click on that link, you should see a question at the top that says, what are the benefits of the PBL approach? Um, and three other little notes up there that say for pupils or students, can't remember what I put, teachers and external partners. You can click on where it looks like there's a little post-it note at the bottom and you can add some words on there and you can drag that and leave it wherever you want. It might get a bit busy because you'll all be contrib uh, contributing at once, but we will give it a go and then we will come back and talk about it. Oh. I can see post-it notes moving and some reference cards moving, that's fine. It's quite good to watch actually, isn't it? I've tried to share the screen. So if uh, if you finished adding yours, if you come back onto the Zoom screen here, you should be able to see what everybody else is adding. We've got words like creative and dynamic, which I think, yes, that is very, very much what we're after. Um, something about experience there, engagement and interest, interaction, another good word, working together to share ideas with others. For the teachers, contacts and ideas, contact is a really big one, we've discovered. Um, once you start generating that network of contacts, uh, it makes it a lot easier, actually. And it was interesting what one of you said earlier about relying on those contacts that you know will work for you and you know will work with you. Um, sometimes it can be quite scary to expand your network of contacts and work with somebody different, uh, but that's and again, another element of the risk that comes in. So I think somebody's deleted the one that said teachers, but that's fine, I'll pop it back. <laughs> Pedagogy, obviously, yes, this is all part of, you know, requiring professional development opportunities and CPD as well, which we did start a couple of years ago. And uh, oh, I see we've got the song that's been added in the chat. Excellent. We'll be looking at that later. Um, yeah, yeah, that again will be saved. So I'll be able to share that with you. If I just 
move on to the next one. And if Danny can share this one, it's pretty much the same link. It's just got the word risks at the end of it. So this is the same sort of question. It's just what are the risks now involved when embarking on a collaborative PBL project? Danny has managed to put the, the link in there. If you click on that, you should get straight to this particular page. And then you can add those comments in exactly the same way. This site can't be reached. It is real. Yeah, mine's not coming up um, either, Alison. Let me double check I've got that right. Okay, here we go. Let's try this one. Is that working for everyone? It was an HTTP, not an HTTPS for some bizarre reason. There we go, I can see the uh, post-it notes moving again. Yeah, I think unclear on assessment. Uh, yeah, we, we do understand that one. And I think in schools in general, that's a really big challenge that has to be addressed um, because schools and school leaderships can be quite hesitant to um, allow is the wrong word, but to, you know, to, to give teachers free reign to maybe do something slightly different just in case it impacts on that assessment and the progress that is obviously so important at the moment for schools to, uh, to be able to evidence very clearly. Um, and as we often say, many of the skills that the students are learning through engaging in PBL, um, they're what we call the soft skills. It's all of your team building and your teamwork and self-esteem development, confidence, motivation. They're very difficult to evidence. So yeah, that is a really big challenge that we've heard many, many times. And uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Articulating to plan. That's difficult. Difficult to get the project moving, yes. It's a different way of working for the students and they're out of their comfort zone, that's exactly it. There's an awful lot of uh, learning curve for the students as well as the teachers here. And in many ways, you're on a joint learning journey because if this is different for all of you together, if there's an element of risk for everybody um, that the teacher may not be the person who's entirely in control the way that they would be in traditional teaching. They're giving the students a lot of ownership and a lot of control. So it's, it's a very different way of working for everybody in some cases. Funding is huge, obviously, on both sides, both schools and teachers and for external partners. Um, there are many, many things that we'd like to do working together, but if the money's not there, what can you do? You can feel free to keep adding to these. Uh, I'm sure that you can see a lot of the other, a lot of the others. And again, you'll be able to um, access those again because I will leave those boards available for everybody. But we're going to whiz on now just to finish things off a little bit with a final poll and a quick bit of discussion and questions from you and a bit from Ulrika and David. Oh, got to unmute. Good job, Alison's here, isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, so you've raised a lot of the kind of risks and the challenges. There are kind of ways of mitigating it that you've sort of come up with, and we've got a resource. Um, if I go on the one that's coming there. So we have this planning guide, and we've got a big section on in there about how you can mitigate these risks, the kind of the steps that you can take. Um, I'm not going to go into that in too much detail now, seeing as we seem to be running out of time slightly. Um, it's it's there. We've got it online. I have actually got. I can hold up. I've got quite a lot of hard copies. So if I get to meet any of you in person and you'd like a hard copy, then I'm very happy. There's also the QR code that Alison did um, <laughs> that would also Scan enable you to read it. Scan it now, and you'll be able to get it up on your phone immediately. So you could do that right now. 
Um, it's got, it takes you through a lot of what we've talked about now, but in a great deal more detail. It shows you how to kind of like start a project small and maybe get bigger and bigger as your confidence grows, thinks about ways of brokerage and all that kind of thing. So we, we think that's basically based on all the work we did over that two year project with the teachers. So it's their kind of knowledge that's, that's created, that's helped us create this guide. David, I think you were going to talk about this slide. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, next, is that my slide? Oh, yes, it is indeed. So if you're an individual teacher, then as we saw from the, the risks slide, there is a lot of challenge in there because it's different, it's not normal. Therefore, there is that, that notion of being out of your comfort zone. So some of the things that can support you in that process are networking. And we have a, a variety of networks through other organizations and teachers are interested. So if you feel that you want uh, friends so that you don't feel alone, then please do get in contact with us. We're very willing to support people uh, as much as we can in the circumstances. Uh, if this is a whole school effort, then CPD, so that teachers not only begin to share their expertise, but get a better grounding, particularly around the issues of planning and working with community partners, that's something worth considering and asking about. And also, at the moment, the, the dominant model of the curriculum is the national curriculum standalone subjects in silos. And the critical thing in the future is to understand that project-based learning is an alternative model for the curriculum. So it is important that everybody who believes that this is a really viable and valuable form of curriculum networks as much as possible so that argument is made. If we stay as individuals trying to fight against the, the kind of dominant form of curriculum, that's really hard work. The more that we network and work together, the better chance we have. And it's not to say that subjects are wrong, subjects shouldn't be taught, but there's many reasons why we need to have both forms of curriculum available to students so they do get a really good whole curriculum that allows them to develop all of their human talents and capabilities. And next. Should I just say this bit? If you could just jot down in the chat, I'm just popping it into the chat there. But if you could just note down in the chat, um, just something that you might take away, because it might be something that the others haven't thought of or haven't encountered or, you know, didn't spring to mind until you were in the session. Many of you here are very skilled in working in this way and have been involved in collaborative projects before, and, and some of you haven't. So if you could jot down in the chat one thing you'll take away from this session that might inspire you or support you or an extra idea that you've had, or if you could offer any support or collaboration, if you've got a really useful tip or a bit of advice, or if you would really like to work with somebody, um, you've got a project in mind, maybe you're an external organization or you're a school teacher and you would just like somebody to work with, if you can pop that in the chat and then don't forget that you can save the chat at the end uh, by clicking on the three little dots and put in save chat and then you've got a record of that. And then we have one final poll for you to take part in. Um, many of you have already taken part in these things, but as the world is moving on a little bit and opening up a little bit, maybe not so much, I don't know how you all feel about that, but do you now feel you could collaborate with others on some sort of innovative project in 2022? Have you been inspired? Have you um, been motivated? <clears throat> have you found a contact that you think you could work with? Um, if Danny pops the, the poll up, we're, we'd like one last response from you, and we're really hoping it's not the last one. <laughs> <laughs> local education partnership yes that's a great one we've worked closely with the with the northeast lep and they're very very good um for employers and cultural organizations so i absolutely agree with that um 
funding to support a network not so much we did start getting together a little bit of a network but of course COVID put pay to that so we will think about that one Amy and it's nice to know there's so many like-minded people uh, as well. Danny can you share the results of, of that poll? Yeah they're being shared at the moment. Is that shared? Brilliant. Well it's really good to see that it's quite positive. We haven't got any it's not for me's so that's what we were aiming for. Um, I can understand the It'll depend on your organisation, definitely, particularly in the current climate and more support information and guidance. We are all here for that. All of our email addresses are on there. We have hard copies of the guide. You can download the guide and you can go onto our website as well. Though it is still a working progress, so apologies for that. But it's really nice to see that over half of you are feeling brave, which one of you pointed out is such a key thing here. So... Thank you very much for that. Andrew, I'll let you sum up and do any final questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, we, we can have, uh, oh, so let's say 30 seconds if anyone would like to pop anything in the chat about any questions um, that you've got for the team there. We'll just give you a, um, a few seconds to think about that. Amy, Amy's asking, Alison, where are you from? I, if, if Alison doesn't answer, I'll tell you later, Amy. Uh, Val's asking, can you share your website link here in the chat? Great, thanks, Alison. Last call for questions. You obviously covered it also very well. Right, thanks, Alison. Great, oh well, thank you very much. It's an absolutely big thank you to Alison, Ulrika and David for that great workshop. And thanks to, for you all for attending and participating so generously. We hope you had a, a fantastic time and a great introduction uh, to PBL. So as I said earlier, um, today's workshop has been recorded and will be available via our YouTube channel from next week. For you to rewatch, we'll, we'll send that out to you at the link. Um, and Danny uh, will also put a link to the feedback form in the chat. It'd be great if you can have a little look at that post. Uh, but we'll yeah, we'll send it out as well in the post workshop email if you don't get to do that uh, right now. Um, yeah, great. Thank, thanks to thanks yeah. to Danny for all the uh, technology support and backup. Really fantastic. <laughs> Uh, yes, and for all the other things she does for us. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Um, Thank you. And if uh, we've only got a couple more sessions left, but there are spaces on those um, if you'd like to to to, uh, to join in. We know there are challenges right now um, in and out of school, but I'll post the link again now to the next two sessions. Uh, so one uh, later on today and then one tomorrow. And I think that's it. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, it was brilliant and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.